G, who until very recently was a uh, Illinois Survey Science Fellow here at uh, the University of Illinois working with Professor Nico Yunus and myself. Uh, but he has just started a staff position at MIT's LIGO lab. So uh, V, please take it away and tell us about your work. Hey, thanks, Gautam. Uh, hopefully you can see my screen. And I don't know, for some reason, it's not going into presentation mode. So I'll just go into the full screen mode and just take it from there. Um, so once again, I'll thank the organizers for letting me give this talk. And uh, I think it's a very good segue from, from Fabio's talk. And uh, as Gautha mentioned, while I've recently moved to the, uh, to the LIGO lab, uh, I was um, a fellow at at CAPS at NCSA, and this is work that I've done with Gautam Narayan's group predominantly. Um, and so I think there, there was a question regarding uh, the detectability of the killer number. So this is an effort towards that direction. Uh, and this is work that we published about last year, around last, uh, last year. So I'll go ahead and give a quick introduction. Um, um, I, although many of you are very familiar with uh, the landscape, but uh, I'll still mention that gravitational wave observations today are routine. Uh, the ground-based detectors like Hanford, Livingston, and Virgo, um, they uh, have detected a total of 90 events as far as uh, the latest catalog of gra gravitational waves is, is concerned. And this jump very sharp. So it started off with three events in the very first observing run in 2015. And within a span of five years, the number has uh, increased by more than an order of magnitude. And uh, this is only expected to scale up even further with the next observing run, uh, when events are possible, uh, the possibility of detecting events is all, almost every one, every one other day. And so while we have detected, uh, you know, an order of, we have been detecting an order of magnitude events previous observing runs so far. Uh, that is not quite true in the case of electromagnetic counterparts. Uh, and so while we are in the era of routine gravitational wave astronomy, we are definitely not there in the era of routine EMGW astronomy. And there's a, there is a long way to go. And that is what the previous observing run uh, showed. That is the challenge to us detecting these joint counterparts. And on the same same note, um, um, so even after five years of its discovery, we still talk about GW170817, which was this picture perfect case of multi-messenger astronomy. Um, but uh, unfortunately, uh, the rest of the so the so-called interesting events have been really hard to follow up. And uh, as a, as a summary, I really like this uh, this plot uh, from from Michael Coughlin's paper where here on the y-axis, uh, it's, it's showing the distance to the sources. And the size of this bubble essentially uh, scales inversely with the size of the sky localization. So the larger, the better. And so Im what immediately stands out is that 170817 was very close, very well localized, but everything else, which is denoted by these numbers, uh, which either starts with an S or have a GW, they are pretty far away and there's this huge gap in, in distance. So events were, uh, interesting events were found farther away and they had much larger sky localizations and, and that has been, been the challenge. And all, also at the same time, I would like to point out certain key words from, from Michael's paper, which I think very nicely conveys uh, this, this aspect of the challenge. The fact that in general, observing strategies have not been very strongly built around all the theor theoretical framework that, that we have had. And also because of this large sky localization, there's a need for coordinated synoptic searches without which it is uh, you know, almost impossible to you know, cover the entire region of the sky. But, but more imp importantly, um, and this is part of you know, this, this talk uh, is relevant to this talk that is Half the battle is about classifying all the new objects that, that you would detect, really filtering them down and cutting it, cutting uh, the, the list down to a few number of really interesting candidates would be uh, the way to go, go ahead. And this is also true because it is unlikely that in, in the future, 
large time allocations will not be awarded uh, for for such uh, you know TO follows because simply because the number of uh, such events will will grow up grow. And so um, so going going ahead, this is what the picture of um, you know the, the picture of a follow up scenario may look like in the future. That is, you have a gravitational wave event, you have a sky localization like this. Uh, this is the probability sky map, but once you go up in the sky and start scanning, you see all these new types of transients. Maybe one of them is a type 1 BC, like so, does not have any previous detections. One of them is a type 2, uh, like so, again, does not have any previous detection, but maybe this location X over here, here is the, is, is the true kilonova that, 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 that you're after, and you want to cut down that, that list real quick. Um, even if you know they are all of them are consistent with the high probability regions of the sky map. And so the rest of my talk will focus on photometric class classification. And before I go any further, I do want to say that uh, photometric classification has been uh, you know a, a pretty old problem in the in the literature, but most of the algorithms have focused on using the full phase information of the of the light curve. Um, and uh, uh, this work, RAPID, which you heard about previously, also in, in Rachel's talk developed by Daniel Muthukrishna and Gautam Narayan, uh, it, it is different because it, it provides real-time classification results. So let me see if this one plays. Okay, so um, the idea is uh, conveyed by this GIF over, over some photometric data coming in. Uh, this is uh, a, a simul simulated 1A. So uh, there's a pre-explosion class, which is high before the explosion. Once the supernova explodes, all the classes take off. And uh, eventually, it's, it's the 1A that uh, gets the maximum score. So, so RAPID was, uh, is, uh, is this kind of uh, temporal network provides real-time classification. But apart from using the photometric information, it also uses it can use any contextual information that, that you provide to it, something like the redshift or any host galaxy information, something that can um, aid the classifier towards uh, classi classifying a particular type of transient better. And so our, our idea was to this rapid algorithm and make it uh, more geared towards kilonova classification. We, uh, we have attempted uh, in doing something simple at the very beginning, because that's what is relevant uh, at, the, at the early stages of discovery. That is a binary class, simple yes, no, if it's a kilonova or, or not. But apart from using the photometric information, because photo, photometry is really sparse during the time of, of discovery, also because kilonova is, is very fast, but also using any kind of contextual uh, information that one, one may have. Uh, during the discovery of a gravitational wave candidate. And so once again, before I go any further, I do want to mention about plastic, which was which you may, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but this is this public challenge that was hosted in 2018. It produced this massive data set, which is publicly available. And this is uh, the data set which rapid uh, used, uh, which was used to train train rapid. We don't use plastic exactly, but we do use many of the um, many of the models that were used in plastic in addition to a few that we incorporate um, uh, inside of the current framework of SNANA, which I'll talk about. Okay, so now just to um, uh, motivate what the use of contextual information or how contextual information helps us. Uh, if, we, if we take that rapid algorithm, which is, which by the way, I should say that it's mostly geared towards supernova classification. And we just take the 170817 light curve, the photometry that's av available publicly from, from DECAM. And I just pass it through this, uh, through the network. So it's expected that there are 10 classes, all of them start out at, at one tenth of the probability. But uh, in this case, the solid line is the kilo, kilo, kilonova class and it, it, it does not do a very good job, but but again, that is expected because um, you know this was primarily geared towards a supernova classification. In this case, the light curve is is really short. However, uh, this is a model that was trained without any contextual information. However, if we do uh, take the, the the stock rapid model that is trained with redshift information, 
and in addition provide the redshift, uh, then that acts as a uh, as some kind of a prior that that sets the the initial Kilonova score apart, and 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 it helps in in the classification. So uh, you know that's the the general idea of uh, of of using contextual information. However, in this case, we cannot use the redshift because the redshift is not available during discovery time. Okay, so you know that's that's not a, so. What we do have in our hand instead is there are several gravitational wave data products that are that are sent out during the discovery time. For example, the gravitational wave sky map itself. So from the sky map, we can definitely get several uh, useful information out. For example every transient, every new transient that is found in the sky will have a line of sight probability, will have a certain angular offset from the moon to the sky sky map. The 90% sky localization area itself can be used as a feature. And it is it's not a surprise that because the kilonovae are correlated with the sky, sky map, things like the angular offset, uh, if, we, if I make a distribution of say the kilonovae angular offset versus every, everything else, it, it sets the kilonovae apart. Likewise, if I take the, the line of sight probability of these of the kilonovae compared to all of the other tra uh, transients, it will set the kilonovae apart. And, and, and so that is the, the contextual information that we use uh, to, to train this, this next uh, classifier uh, that I'll that I'll talk about in a, in a in a in a bit. Now, of course, I mean we cannot work with real uh, objects because we have only seen one exhaustive kilo, kilo, kilonova so far, uh, one kilonova that has been studied exhaustively. So so so, so we use simulated uh, light curves, um, and here our main simulation engine is is SNANA which is widely used in, in several aspects of LSSD. There's multiple spanning several aspects of supernova cosmology or light curve fitting, but here we mostly use it for uh, fake light curve generation. So what we do is um, we use the Kaysen model that was already present as a part of plastic, but we also incorporate these new Bulla uh, models that 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 have been uh, that are more recent and, and have been used in um, several uh, studies uh, uh, more recently. So we incorporate them inside of SNANA, and, and our starting um, uh, data set is, uh, you know, we we simulate a, a large ensemble of these light curves, take it through the ZTFDR three publicly. Uh, available cadence that is that's that that's there. We we compute the efficiency of, of ZTF from the publicly available data, and the end products are observed light curves like this. And of course, this is just one detected light curve. And uh, you know, when we do it for our entire ensemble, we get something like a sky local as a, a sky map, like so. Of course, there are no observations in the galactic plane. And uh, we, we also get a distribution of, uh, of red shifts. So uh, here I'm plotting the distribution, the detected uh, red between the Bulla and the Kaysen model. And uh, what we see is there are no current selection effects between, between the two, uh, two models. Maybe uh, the Kaysen model is found out to slightly higher red shifts, but, but overall, uh, this distribution peaks at around 0.2, uh, which is order 110 uh, megaparsecs. And so these are the light curve simulations. Of course, these are only the kilonova simulations, but we also have to simulate the entire rest of the sky. So which is where we resort to these plastic models, which were already there as a part of SNMA. So we simulate several supernova models and anti-tidal disruption events. More models are in under development and, and will be used in future studies. Um, but eventually what we do is we, we take, um, uh, you know, order 9,000 kilo, kilonova models and almost a factor of 20 times more of other models for our binary classification. 
although we have tried using different relative ratios and, and found that the result uh, is not affected significantly. And, and, and so at this point, we, we have our kilonova light curves. We have our other light curves, but we still need the gravitational wave ob observables. So what we, what we do is we, we, we associate a binary and, and we do this constantly. We, we take a binary simulation. We uh, simulate the gravitational wave stream we see if it is detected in, 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 in the gravitational wave detector. We calculate its ejector properties um, using a phenomenal, phenomenological fit, actually, actually the same one that uh, you heard Fabio talk about, the Dietrich and Wavic fit, to get the M ejector. And then it is that M ejector dictates which SED model we choose to feed into SNM. So once again, we simulate the gravitational wave binaries, we get the sky localizations, that's our gravitational wave observable. And then from the ejector prop properties, we uh, feed, we choose the right um, SED model and we get realistic light, uh, light curves out of SNANA like so. And then we once again use SNANA to simulate the rest of the sky. So our supernovae and our TDs, the things that will classify, that will be considered as contaminants. And then that entire data set, so that's our full data set, including the sky maps, the kilonova light curves, and the other light curves. And uh, we use that and uh, train this temporal convolutional network. It's the same network arch architecture as was in RAPID. We did do some adjustments uh, so that it is tuned towards more shorter light curves, more shorter time intervals. But here, the arch architecture is such that uh, the, uh, the output of this TCN depends only on inputs up to uh, uh, you know the, the time that that, that you're that you're cons considering, and so it is more uh, suitable towards catching features which are something like the rise of the light curve or the fall of the of the light curve and uh, and and uh, and time series basically time series classification. So for us, the training data is the the fluxes in in, in the different ZTF bands. And also the, the sky map contextual information, which is the uh, line of sight probability, the angular offset, the 90% sky localization, all of, all, all of that are static contextual information, which is also something that we pass to our network for, for, for training. And we do a 60-40 split and cross entropy loss to train our network. And, and so here, what I'm showing is uh, a classification accuracy. And the gray plot is, uh, and mind you, this is, as a function of, of, of time. Uh, so what, what, this is, what this plot is telling you is that if you look at the gray curve, what this is telling us is that for kilonovae, because there are so few points light curve, the photometric information is, is not really uh, you know, doing much. You know, if, you, if you do have uh, the, fo the kilonova, you know, most of them will be uh, you know, consistent localization so you can you can get a high high uh, classification score just out of that contextual information however the more important one is this green curve which is you know everything else so initially without any photometric information just from the contextual information you're able to do some classification however as more classification as more photometric information comes in your classification gets gets better so let's consider a scenario when you know a supernova is right in the center of a very high probability sky map uh, your first prior knowledge is that, well, it, it is consistent with the sky map, so it's a killer, killer number, but as more photometric information comes in, you're able to uh, disqualify that and, and go on to other candidates. So that's the use case that we are imagining. So of course, we did not use 170817 in our training set, but that's of course, uh, you know, the only real data uh, or rather the real event that is available to us. And it's a good data set because it's very heterogeneous with uh, uh, data taken by different instruments, different cadences. Uh, we only selected the ones that, that are in similar filters as, as ETF. And what we find is that the results are, 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 are pretty promising. Uh, so this is DCAM, SWOP, PS1, all data taken from the open kiln of a catalog. And also here, LCO, Magellan, HST, um, we find that you know, the 
the classification score uh, is is consistent. It, it, it is able to classify uh, uh, this object as a kilonova. There is some uh, there is a turnover in in case of LCO, and I can I can get to that if if, if there's a question. But uh, we also went ahead and tested this out on. Another important uh, or rather an interesting candidate from O3, this one called AT2019 NPV, which was consistent with the 1908-14 sky map. 1908-14 was one of the best localized event. It was even better, better localized than 1708-7. And uh, here this X mark shows the location of the, of the can candidate. And it did create a lot of excitement during the discovery time, but was later ruled out as a type one BC. And what we find is that as we feed the, that light curve information in, uh, this uh, classifier is able to, to, to rule it out. Um, it's not being a killer. Number. So, so that's the- Deep two minutes left. Okay. Uh, so that's the uh, use case that you know, we envision. And so uh, of course, uh, our next step is, uh, integrating a data product like this with the alert brokers, just like Rapid has been done. Uh, because uh, at the end of the day, the photometric classification is just one aspect, the entire coordination between different surveys, talking to downstream brokers, scheduling robotic telescopes, all of this will, uh, you know, all of this is needed to uh, achieve success in the ultimate um, goal of, uh, of EMGW astronomy. So I'll just end with this one, uh, one slide. You have heard about Elastic yesterday from Alice, Alex Galliano. And uh, what, we, what we plan to do for Elastic is because we, we have this data set, um, you know, we can uh, provide this to the community. And, and that is what we plan to do. So Elastic, just as a quick reminder, it's a, it's a streaming mock data challenge to test the plumbing and validation for the alert brokers. It will contain his host galaxy information, which was not there in, 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 in plastic. Um, and, uh, and what we intend to do with whatever I presented is that uh, we have the Kilonova light curves, uh, which are again, once again, generated using the white fast deep cadence. And of course, because uh, with, with our prescription, we can assign, we can assume that a Kilonova is coming from a binary candidate. And uh, for, for the Kilonova, which are jointly detected, we can provide a gravitational wave, waves as well. So I think I'll stop there and, and, and take questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Pete. <laughs> questions for us? <coughs> oh, there's one on Zoom. Uh, Niharika, please feel free to go ahead and unmute. Uh, hi, Deep. So my question was with uh, regard to your metrics. So you post uh, an accuracy of identification about 90%. I'm not sure exactly what the numbers were, I don't remember. Uh, but you know, obviously the training data set had some qualities, probably you had some cuts to include them in, in your in your test. Uh, most of the Kilonovi that we will see from 04 will be faint. So if you were, a, can you, are, are you able to convert your classification uh, metrics to the population of Kilonovi expected to see from O4 and tell sort of like give me sort of like an identification um, uh, confidence like say this percentage will be identified within some percent of uh, within some amount of time can you do that um, so let's 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 see let me just uh, reiterate what we did and maybe you know that will uh, you know help me uh, answer that question. So, so what we did is, you know, we regarding the population of Kironobe. So we we did a uniform in in co-moving volume. You know, that was our, uh, you know, we did not follow any rate model as such because these will be fairly located close by, and and so um, you know we started off with a large number order six million objects of each type. We distributed out them. We just distributed them uniformly in co-moving co volume. And, and only a small fraction of them was recovered. Okay, so only a... Um, what we say is, you know, the, the distribution of Kilinovi that went into our training set with all, with all the selection effects. 
And so, um, you know, there will be uh, Kilinovi, which have very few data, da data points. Our selection criteria over here was two detections. So that, that's where, you know, we, we, that's what we consider a detection. And uh, these metrics are, are based on that. Does that does that help? I mean, I I I don't know if I was able. Yeah. To... So, uh, what what? How would that ninety percent translate to the population that you would see for O four, which will primarily consist of paint stuff? So you're not looking at something. Um, uh... If you're looking at paint stuff, uh, what what you will see is probably things like maybe objects which have at best a very sparse photography, so maybe two data points. Uh, on your entire light curve. So in, in that case, you know, contextual information is the one that mostly drives your classification. So, uh, and, and I would say that, you know, that fact is, is baked in here um, because, you know, we distribute our Kilonove out to a large distance and then, then we, uh, we put our, so our Kilonovi are, are detected, you know, we, we don't put any ad hoc cuts, you know, except for, for the fact that, you know, we need two detections on the light curve, for example. So you're saying for all Kilonovi during 04, which will have two detections, you will be able to accurately identify 90% of them. The, or most importantly, yes, that is, uh, that is correct. But most importantly, you know, this is, this is for everything else, all the other transients that happen at the same part of the sky localization. What, what I'm saying here is uh, I, would, I would focus mostly on the rule out 99% of the contaminants. That's, that's, that's probably a, a better you know, message. We've got another question here from the audience from Andy Howell. Yeah, what was the turnover with LCO data you talked about? Yes, so so here uh, the so our data set primarily consisted of uh, you know light curves which uh, sort of ended uh, at uh, you know around uh, the fifth or the. This is something that that we noticed. That for any light curve that goes beyond that time frame, uh, we found that the classifier, because it 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 was not the data set has not been aug augmented. There is a turnover that uh, that we see that is a net, net starts to think that anything that is longer than uh, something around the the fifth day to be you know going spilling over to the other category. And uh, this, by the way, you know, I have I have not shown this. I have not extended the x-axis beyond uh, the seventh day mark. But but this happens consistently with with all other uh, observations as well. Because uh, with with seventeen oh eight seventeen, the data you know was was taken up to much much more depth than uh, than just uh, you know seventies. It was much more beyond that. It's just that in 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 the LCO, uh, you know, we we see this uh, around the fourth or fifth day mark, uh, and and uh, uh, this is expected to go away once we augment our our data set to 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 contain longer light curves. We have another question from the room from Dylan Brout. Yeah, hi. Thanks for the talk. Um, I haven't quite thought thought this through fully yet, but maybe you have. Um, if this is a sample that you're going to identify that gets used for cosmology or H naught, um, and you're planning on using the line of sight information, that's that's like the distance. So you're using that as a prior to help decide what you're including in your sample. Does that can can that bias you? Actually, we were not intending you know this to be used for cosmology. Okay. Uh, I mean, yeah, we were, you know, this directed towards you know, something like a search, you know, as opposed to a parameter estimation and uh, Hubble constant and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, you don't, 
I'm not sure if uh, if it can uh, bias. I think I'll, I'll 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 have to think think about it uh, a little bit and 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 get back to you. But uh, you know, to answer your or, original question, I mean, no, I mean, we were not thinking this to be be to be used for cosmology in 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 some sense. I mean, are you are you talking about the fact that say this algorithm says that a kilonova and then uh, you use that information to do some kind of cosmological inference? Dylan says yes. Okay, so then that would be a post-processing step. So that would be most like, so the way I think of it, there are two steps. There is a search and a parameter estimation. This is like the search. Whereas you know, any kind of cosmological inference, which uh, you know, if you intend to do parameter estimation with uh, you know, this kind of a light curve, that would be step number two, and and we don't right. do that. That is more of right. you know what Fabio talked talked about. Okay, yeah. I just want to make sure that whoever is doing the second step is interfacing with you and making sure that they're aware that you're using that information and it won't cause a bias. So, just so we can all get on the same page. So yep. we are out of time for questions. Uh, I know there are a couple of other questions. I've asked those speakers to to ask you on Slack, Deep. Thank you again for uh, a wonderful talk. Uh, and let's thank all of our speakers from the morning session again. Thank you. We are uh, going to be breaking.